I grew up in a family of Irish Americans. When I say that, it sounds like wolves, but um, <laughs> it was a culture in which the men were expected, the male children were expected to grow up and become uh, priests or alcoholics. And um, I always feel like I should uh, um, amend the introduction by saying, my name is Tom and I am not a priest. <laughs> Nonetheless, I was named for a priest, my father's uncle, who got his vocation when he survived a hundred years ago now, the Spanish flu epidemic, and his mother said it was a miracle and suggested that God had saved him for a reason which he might sort out at seminary. Because he was ever after that a chesty and croupy and sickly boy, the bishop in Detroit sent him out west for seminary to live out his vocation in the high, dry air of the blood of Christ mountains in New Mexico, among landscapes that Georgia O'Keeffe would eventually make famous. They were all hoping that that dry desert air would inure to his good fettle and future health. And it did, at least for a couple of years, after which he got pneumonia, which led to tuberculosis in the summer of 1936 and he died in the care of the Apaches and Anglos he ministered to in Taos, New Mexico. The native women brought him down the mountain in a box, in a horse-drawn wagon, along the upwaters of the Rio Grande into the city of Holy Faith, Santa Fe, where the bishop met the body in the box at the back of the church and after the re re requisite obsequies, put it on a train bound east for Michigan, sending the corpse collect, as bishops do. <clears throat> it was met by undertakers in Jackson, Michigan, where my great-grandfather settled after leaving County Clare. On the day that my grandfather, the priest's brother, <clears throat> went into the Denoyer funeral home to discuss requiems and mum plants and grave openings, he took along, for reasons we'll never really know, um, his 12-year-old boy, my father. And while the men discussed all the details of the priest's funeral, my father wandered through the old house until he came to a room in which he saw through the open door two men in shirt sleeves, careful that they were wearing striped ties, striped pants, shiny black shoes, and they were dressing the corpse of his uncle in its liturgical vestments after which they organized themselves at either end of the body and running their arms underneath the, the corpse and keeping their back straight and hinging their legs ergonomically, they hoist the body up into their embrace and carefully sidestepped to the coffin in which they laid him. And it was to this moment in August of 1936, that my father would ever after trace his intention to become a funeral director. He was 12 years old. And um, whenever he'd tell us this story, one of us, I, I, I'll cop to it, I would often say to him, Eddie, we called him Eddie at that time, Eddie, why didn't you, why didn't you want to become a priest? Ah, Tom, he'd say the priest was dead. <laughs> Dead as a mackerel, and a dead man's no good. I think he learned that from his grandfather, who would have brought it from County Clare anyway. Seventy years later, I heard it from what would have been his second cousin, Nora Lynch. Dead man no good, referring to a corpse washed up in the bay after a fishing misadventure. Such was the moment of my father's calling, his vocation his summons into the service of mortuary arts. He saw his work as serving the living by caring for the dead, and there must have been some contagion to this summons because seven of his nine children <clears throat> and two dozen, or excuse me, a dozen of his two dozen grandchildren eventually followed him in their own time into that trade, and now we operate half a dozen funeral homes that bear his name and conduct 13 or 1400 funerals every year, endeavoring to do as he did, serve the living by caring for the dead. And as the program mentions, I lead 
as apparently all of you do, a uh, hyphenated, uh, hyphenated life. I am not a priest and I am not a doctor, but surely I am among doctors who are also artists and you know, pulmonologists slash parents and um, uh, bloggers and radiologists and rock stars. And, um, and I do think of funerals, good funerals, as a kind of good medicine. And I'm concerned that as a culture, we've gone a little bit astray when it comes to the care of the living and the dead. I became an, an undertaker slash poet which is to say I embalm and I write sonnets, and I'm happy to discuss anything in between those topics. And um, the preoccupations keep me out of the bar and off the road to early ruin. Corpses and couplets really interest me. <laughs> it is, I suppose, the occupational equivalent of a proctologist with a sideline and root canal. No one, no one really wants to hear about it. On, on either account. But I have mostly gotten over this wholesale rejection and am ever the more so delighted to have a half hour of your good attention after lunch when you might be nodding off, and you may, and uh, you might swoon, I'll say it's because of genius. And, uh, but if you snore, we'll do what we call a removal, which in my line of work <laughs> is serious, so you are forewarned. I will, on the other hand, read a poem, maybe two today, so that you can go home and tell your teenagers that among other things you did at Dot Med was you attend a poetry reading. This will make them fear you in ways they don't currently. <laughs> um, now, being at Smock Alley, this 17th century theater royale, which is, as you note from the stained glass windows and the cruciform up top, um, a former church as well. And I want to stand with the comments just made by Emma and Jonathan about value, understanding the patient's value being an important part of the file on those patients. And certainly, <clears throat> while I am neither a priest nor a doctor, I can't imagine any clergy person understanding the, uh, the life and times of their parishioners or co-religionists without understanding what's happened to them medically nor can I understand a doctor understanding anything about uh, a patient without knowing what they believe or disbelieve in, whether they're devoted or devoutly lapsed. So I think there is a natural affinity between the intersection of medicine and religion and theater. So I'm glad to be here talking to a room full of medicos in a place that has been both a church and a theater. It, puts me in mind of a place I read years ago in the neighboring island, a place near the London Bridge, also near a river, also formerly a church, also currently a theater. They call it the Old Operating Theater, and some of you may have been there. It's a 17th century room with the same type of seating, the amphitheatrics, because as we know, all theaters are seeing places, literally seeing places. So this raised seating and somehow the unflinching nature of the, the uh, benches keep, uh, keep people awake for some reason. But the organizers of the reading that year thought, wouldn't it be nice for Halloween or the Feast of All Souls if we had that undertaker in with a full dose of you know, grim reaping and <laughs> men in black uh, kind, kind of nonsense. So. Um, it, it, it brought me to, to write on the plane over to London that time this poem, which I'll read to you. Um, of course, I wrote it to the uh, universal disinterest of anyone else. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, because most poets and most poems are internationally unheard of and universally ignored, I'm reminded of Don Marquis, a poet none of you will have heard of, who said, Writing poems is like throwing rose petals over the Grand Canyon and hoping for an echo. <laughs> Surely your lives must seem like that sometime. When you see those spirals in the eyes of your patients or children. In any event, this is called 
the old operating theater, London, All Souls Night. It's a surgical poem, and I give it in thanks to Himanshu Patel, the uh, surgeon who cracked my chest and put a pig valve in me some years ago. I said, don't I have any choices? He said, yes, you can have a cow or a pig. And <laughs> I said, give me a Frisian. I've had good luck with them. And uh, when I woke up, he said, we thought the pig suited you. <laughs> the old operating theater, London, All Souls Night. To rooms like this, old resurrectionists return the bodies they had disinterred. Fresh corpses so fledgling anatomists could study origin and insertion points of deltoids, pecs, trapezius, and count the vertebrae, the ball and socket joints, and learn the private parts and Latin names by which the heart becomes a myocardium, the high cheekbones, a zygoma, the brain more, less prone to daydream as a cerebellum, and Squirming in their stiff, unflinching seats, apprentice surgeons witnessed in the round new methods of advanced colostomy, the amputation of gangrenous limbs, and watched as Viennese lobotomists banished the ravings of a raving man, but left him scarred and drooling in a way that made them wonder, was he much improved? But here the bloodied masters taught dispassionate incisions how to suture and remove. In rooms like Vix, the Greeks and Romans staged their early dramas. Early Christians knelt and hummed their liturgies when it was held that prayer and penance were the only potions. Ever since Abraham, guided by God, first told his tribesmen of that deal he'd made, their foreskins for that ancient covenant, good medicines meant letting human blood. Good props include the table and the blade. Good theater is knowing where to cut. You often wonder, as I do, how it was that in that section of Genesis where God is making his deal with Abraham, they landed on circumcision as sort of the deal maker. You know, they could have had a secret handshake. <laughs> <clears throat> A nod and wink, a tattoo, a secret sign. But no, circumcision. Who thinks of this stuff? I say to myself. But it's at this point I want to alert you to a little error in the program. Um, when Ms. Sullivan asked me what the name of my program would be, I told her that we could talk about um, something in general that would give me time to uh, work on it. But... I meant to say the, um, the heavy lift, uh, Humanity 101, uh, and it, but I typed the heavy life, and I've always hovered nearer to 20 stone than 10, so I think this probably works either way, but I should, I should point out to you that the language is full of these sort of transpositions, life, lift, livid, they all appear on the same page of the dictionary, much as grave and... Um, gravity and gravid and gravitas. And it strikes me as odd that the language is full of such wisdoms whereby the, the, word for, uh, the word for pregnancy and the word for the pit we buried our, our dead in is, uh, is the very same. The lexicon will get over it. We humans are related to the humus out of which our cities and our architecture rise, and we are all bound together by a human chain, as Heaney told us. We are all part of a heavy life, a heavy lift. And at a conference on the frontiers of medicine, it's worth mentioning that death is maybe the final frontier to which each and every one of us gets in our own good time. But gets to nonetheless. You can try this at home. The numbers are fairly convincing on this, <laughs> hovering as they do around 100%. <laughs> and as I listen to 
the men and women present today, I keep thinking, I'm speaking to people who spend their lives trying to keep the sky from falling. The sky is falling. And as someone who has spent his life, his life working with people on whom it has fallen, I have to tell you, good medicine goes the distance with the living and the dead. And I want to encourage you to think of the dead as still important to the living. The dead don't care about much. I, I know this, I've noticed this, I've spent as much time with dead people as I can. They're a mum on the subject of the blue suit or the pinstripe one. They don't care about roses or carnations, none of that. Um, they never say, I want the copper casket instead of the pine box. They are, uh, they don't care. And, uh, but they do matter. And to the extent that your patients become, if God is good, uh, um, corpses in the fullness of time, um, they still have people to whom they matter. And your presence with those people, your willingness to stand in and answer questions and take whatever abuse may be coming, and there is abuse, I, I, I'll grant you, but your showing up and pitching in and doing your part is part of the very best medicine that you'll ever do because ours is a species that deals with death, the big idea of the thing, by dealing with its dead, the thing itself. It is by getting the dead where they need to go that the living get where they need to be. And this is what I mean by our culture going a little bit astray. We seem to have banished lately the dead from their own obsequies. Have you noticed this? Everybody's welcome except the one who has died. We disappear them more readily nowadays. We take them out of our conversations and I, and I think we should be careful about that because the dead today are the same as the dead 50,000 years ago when the first Neanderthal widow someplace in East Africa or the Urals awoke to the dead lump of protein next to her and said to herself, he's very quiet today. <laughs> and she would have sensed at the time, depending on the weather, sooner or later, she would have sensed that this was a stillness she'd never seen before. And before long, she'd have to figure out what she was going to do about this next. If she had friends, she'd enlist them in the job of getting him out of here. Because, and this you can try at home, you can live with a broken heart. You can live with a shaken faith. But you cannot live with a rotting corpse. <laughs> the priest in my town often calls me and says, why do they call you first? And I say, we answer the phone. <laughs> and we do. And like you, the phone rings in the middle of your dinner, in the middle of your sleep, in the middle of your daughter's graduation, in the middle of your son's wedding. Your lives are constantly given over to the care and comfort and cure and renewal of fellow species mates because mostly death punctuates life in a way that nothing else does. We are the only species, as far as I know, um, all living things uh, will die. But we seem to be the only ones who know it and are paused, given pause by it. You can try this with rock bass and rhododendrons and cocker spaniels. They could care less. If you have two goldfish at home, kill one. The other one just eats more. <laughs> There is some talk about chimpanzees and elephants, but I'm telling you for the most part, humans, those of us of the earth, us, we people, are the ones to whom this seems to matter. I think I want to finish now with maybe one more poem. I last heard your poet, Heaney, read at Emory University in March of 2013. I had seen him just a couple months before when our, the friend we shared, Dennis O'Driscoll, another gra grand poet and bookish man had died on Christmas Eve 2012. Because Seamus had had a stroke six years before that and because I had had heart surgery a year before that, we 
brought up the rear of the walking cortege that took Dennis from the church to his grave in, is it Nace County Kildare? God help us. And we talked and about the tears of things and we talked about our friendship with Dennis and we talked about the things we would miss about him. On the day I last heard Heaney read, it was at Emory University and I was down there among the Wesleyans and Calvinists teaching them how to use language in their sermons. <laughs> the things they'll pay you for. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I heard, as you might imagine, an awful lot of scripture, including the story that appears in three of the four gospels about Jesus curing the paralytic. Um, a story that had resonance with Heaney, who, like myself, I think, was devoutly lapsed, but deeply literate religiously. And um, Heaney directs us to look away from what the evangelist tells us. You'll all remember the story. They're gathered in this house in Capernaum, and uh, uh, because the crowd is so great, uh, Four men take the paralytic up on the roof and dig through the ceiling tiles and, the, and let him down by ropes into the, um, into the middle of the crowd whereupon Jesus, impressed by their faith, says, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now the begrudgers, and there are always begrudgers, over in the corner, they're saying to one another, we have them. They're just thinking it. To themselves. We have him now, he's blasphemed, only God can forgive sins, etc., etc., etc. And Jesus, because he's Jesus, says, Why do you think such things? Or words to that effect. And he says this, I think, very interesting. He says, What's more difficult, to say your sins are forgiven or to say arise and walk? Of course, it's a trick question. Almost all of them are in the Bible. Because Forgiveness is impossible. Don't we know it? Who among us hasn't been harmed or hurt or wounded badly by usually someone we love the most or are dearest to us? And how can we forgive them or forgive ourselves? And aren't we all a little paralyzed by it all of our lives, all of our times? In the poem, Heaney says, never mind either of those miracles the forgiveness or the standing and walk, walking. Having suffered a stroke some years before, he knew that the ones who had known him all along, the ones who had strapped him to the gurney and helped him down the stairs and into the ambulance and on the way to Letterkenny Hospital were the ones who had known him all along. They got him where he needed to go. They went the necessary distance with him. This is the stuff and substance of good medicine, these ordinary miracles that we do for one another, and that each of you, in your own practice, collude in with patients and colleagues and the rest of it. Miracle. Not the one who takes up his bed and walks, but the ones who have known him all along and carry him in. Their shoulders numb, their ache and stoop deep locked in their backs. The stretcher handles slippery with sweat and no let up until he's strapped on tight, made tiltable and raised to the tiled roof, then lowered for healing. Be mindful of them as they stand and wait for the burn of the paid out ropes to cool their slight lightheadedness and incredulity to pass, those ones who had known him all along. I was put in mind of this again when some few months after Dennis O'Driscoll died and some few months after Heaney read at Emory, um, the word came over every available digital medium that Heaney had died on a Friday morning at the end of August in Black Rock Clinic. I don't know who's in charge of the fact that I had my ticket in hand to leave for West Clare that day, 
So I got a car in Shannon and drove up to Dublin and into Fannigan's to see the man who had hovered over poetry all of my life and who for, I suppose, 45 years had been the most amplified and articulate agent of the language arts. And uh, because I've been a funeral director for about the same time, I pressed David Fannigan to let me do something. He said, well, there's room in the hearse for you to ride shotgun. I said, good, someone who knows the poem should go along. I felt this duty, if not to do shoulder and shovel work, but at least to witness. And this is why I encourage you to be among the people of the dead when the time comes, as it always does because you will be improved by it. It presses you against the ontological and the existential and the deeply human 101. Because that poor Neanderthal widow 50,000 years ago, by the time she got her dead man either out of the cave or left in it, or into a ditch or a cliff over it, or into the sea, or the fire, or the tree for the scavenger birds to come and pick its bones clean. Whatever abyss she consigned him to, it was looking into that abyss that she asked what I believe are signature human questions. The ones that are rummaging around everybody in your waiting rooms, everybody in your surgeries, everybody in your recovery rooms. Is that all there is? Can this happen to me? Why is it cold? Am I all alone? What comes next? Those questions will ring in the ears and the hearts and minds of every widowed person who becomes widowed today. Every parent, God help us, who must bury a child. Every child, God help us, who buries a parent. And I think it's important to understand that being there doesn't mean just for the functional human. It means for every human. And I can tell you that seeing the poet's countrymen stopped at overpasses as the hearse made its trip north to Balahi for burial, cars stopped in their tracks, folks out in the road applauding the black glacier of the poet's hearse making its way back home for burial. Whole communities out in the road to sing and weep and pray and bless. This is Humanity 101. And doctors are high priests who ought to show up for it because the bishops aren't fit for it as they once were. So you can do some really good medicine by making yourself part of that when you can, to the extent that time allows. A phone call, a bereavement letter, five minutes at the wake, a cameo appearance at the funeral, a handful of dirt over the grave. It is the same large muscle lowering of ropes that got the paralytic healed, that got Heaney into the ground in Balahi. It's a holy space and deeply human and one for which we should be on hand. I, um, I'll finish with one story. Am I over time? Have I gone past the two, two minutes? People sometimes ask me about good funerals. I'm going down to Clare this evening to a house that I inherited there, a little house that's not as big as the bandstand. But it is the house my great-grandfather came out of, and I treasure it. I was there, uh, I wasn't there, but I flew there when I got word of uh, James E. Carmody dying. He'd been a neighbor for a long time. And I showed up in the morning, and... Um, I was there when he was laid out in the kitchen on the table. 
I was there when the priest made his bereavement call, and I was in earshot of his widow when the priest said, Maura, whatever happened to Jamesy? I didn't know he was sick. Ah, she said, Father, it was the gonorrhea that swept him. <laughs> the priest blushed, as they used to do, and uh, um, shook his bald head and said, Ah, oh, geez, we never had anybody in this parish that died of, died of gonorrhea, Maura, but it must have been that time he went up to Dublin and <laughs> attended the conference, and maybe he <laughs> fell in with the wrong crowd, and, uh, and he went away with the beads of sweat <laughs> bubbling on the top of his bald head, and I was still in earshot when the daughter came around to upbraid the mother for giving out to the priest that way. Mammy, why did you ever tell Father Culligan that it was gonorrhea that swept Denny? It was not gonorrhea, it was diarrhea that killed him. <laughs> What's in a word we say? <laughs> Don't scold me, my dear, the mother said. I'd rather your father be remembered for the great lover he never was <laughs> than for the big shit he always seemed to be. <laughs>